the Harvard Graduate School of Education, working at the nexus of practice, policy, and research. Good morning, everyone. That was good. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Steve Seidel, and as the faculty director of the Arts and Education program here at the uh, Graduate School of Education, it's my pleasure and my great honor to welcome you to this special symposium called in Educating for Moral Agency and Engaged Citizenship. I want to acknowledge Kathy McCartney, Dean of the Graduate School of Education, who's with us today. I know that Kathy uh, joins me in extending a special welcome to all of you, but especially those of you both on stage and in the audience uh, who are not part of our immediate community here at the School of Education. We're delighted to have you with us this morning. I also want to welcome Laurie Gross. Laurie is the uh, Harvard's Associate Provost for Arts and Culture, and she's done so much to support and expand the arts at Harvard, but also especially to make this morning's event possible. So thank you, Laurie, and our thanks to all of your terrific colleagues. I also want to acknowledge um, the W.E.B. Du Bois Institute for African American, African and African American Research. Are there people from the Institute here? Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> the Institute is our co-host for this event and we thank you for helping us make this come together. Uh, this brings me to uh, our special guest from outside our university and outside our campus, although he's, he's really with us at the university for several years. Um, that's Wynton Marsalis. Wynton, in addition to welcoming you to the School of Education, I want to thank you for your incredible lecture last night. Uh, like your other talks here in the past year, it was provocative in the best sense, uh, challenging us to think about all of the music we listen to, where it comes from, what it represents, how it can help us to understand who we are, and especially important, I think, the extraordinary role that musicians have played in both forging the best aspects of our complex American identity and culture, and as courageous leaders in the civil rights movement. Indeed, so much of what you spoke of last night, especially in relation to the powerful, though generally underappreciated, role of musicians in American history relates directly to our themes this morning of what it means to act with moral agency and as engaged citizens. So for all of that and so much more, Winton, thank you. I also want to extend a very warm and very special welcome to two distinguished faculty members from the university community beyond the School of Education. Diane Moore and Lonnie, uh, from the Harvard Divinity School and Lonnie Guineer from the Harvard Law School. Great to have you here. And I'm delighted and grateful that our wonderful School of Education colleagues, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot, Rick Weisbord, and Karen Mapp made time to be here with us for this morning's conversation. So welcome to all of you on stage and welcome to all of you in the audience. Thank you for coming from within the school and from outside the school today. I want to just make a few brief comments about the focus of this morning's conversation. Many of us in higher education worry that young people entering adulthood, the workforce and community life are not adequately prepared for the moral dilemmas they are likely to encounter in this complicated society. Many powerful social forces and competing values are at work in our fast-paced lives and in these very trying economic times. Most of us experience confusion about how to act in accordance with our sense of what it means to be a good person, to act honorably and consider the needs and interests of others in balance with our own needs and interests. Further, in an individualistic and materialistic society such as ours, political apathy is far more often the norm than engaged citizenship. 
from schoolyard and internet bullying to intellectual property theft to the greed that contributed to our current economic crisis, young people and adults are making the news every day with evidence of our failure to graduate students with a sense of moral agency, which I think of as the capacity and the commitment to act in accordance with one's moral codes and as active and engaged citizens, living and acting with a strong sense of personal responsibility for and a commitment to the public good. Now, to be sure, there are huge moral ambiguities in contemporary life, and it is wrong to assume that we have clear, socially agreed upon moral standards in America right now, or just what we mean by the public good is not always all that clear. Given that, the question of our responsibility as educators to address these issues in our classrooms, in, um, in our interactions with students, as mentors, and in our work with our colleagues may be even more urgent, not because there are clear answers, but because that very lack of clarity makes it all the more urgent that we create spaces both in schools and in public forums for dialogue about our ethics and about our engagement. In many ways, this event, Educating for Moral Agency and Engaged Citizenship, is an attempt to advance exactly this kind of dialogue, a sincere attempt to engage with these issues in a public forum with the goal of inquiry and exploration more than arriving at absolute answers or easy solutions. Now, now, it is my pleasure to introduce Karen Mapp, our facilitator for this morning's conversation. Karen is the faculty director of the Education Policy and Management Program and a lecturer on education here at the Graduate School of Education. Karen's uh, areas of research and expertise are in educational leadership and partnerships among schools, families, and community members, and we're really delighted that she was willing and able to facilitate this conversation this morning. Karen will introduce our other panelists and the plan for the morning, which will include an opportunity for you all to join in the conversation. So welcome and have a wonderful time. to see you all. Now, those of you who are my students out in the room, you know that this is not the usual time for me that I talk to anybody, because it usually <laughs> takes me about until noontime for my voice to properly get itself adjusted, but we'll make the best of it, right? Okay. So we are going to get started. Actually, Steve, you did a wonderful job with the introductions, and people have their programs which have uh, longer introductions of all of the panelists. So I think what we'll do is we'll let you take a look at those if you want, sort of the longer view of each one of our wonderful people here on the panel. Uh, and I think we're going to just go ahead and get started. Is that okay with everybody? That's great. Okay. Now what I've asked the panelists to do is to treat this as more of a dialogue and conversation. To talk to each other, at each other. Uh, if there's a comment made that you want to respond to, please jump in. This isn't going to be the type of panel where I'll be calling on you each individually, one at a time. Those are boring. We don't want to do that. We really want to have a dialogue, okay? And for this to be very energetic. And after about an hour, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a little assignment in the audience. Yes. Okay. Uh, and we'll take a little break then uh, to talk to each other for a minute about what we've heard and then have an opportunity for a Q&A. Lonnie, unfortunately, has to leave a little bit early, around 11, so when we, when we turn it back to you for your assignment, um, she, she, will, she will have to, to go. And uh, so that's going to be the agenda. I hope that's okay with everybody. All right. So we are obviously going to start with Winton uh, <laughs> as our special guest. And so, Winton, I'm going to ask you a question about your book, Higher Ground, which, by the way, must be doing very well because I was not able to get a copy. I looked <laughs> in every bookstore around here, uh, and there wasn't anything available, so congratulations on that. That's not why you couldn't get it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now, now. 
So in reference to your book, Higher Ground, uh, you note that you wanted, quote, to show how great musicians demonstrate on the bandstand a mutual respect and trust that can alter your outlook on the world and enrich every aspect of your life, from individual creativity and personal relationships to conducting business and understanding what it means to be an American in the most modern sense. So how do the ideas that Steve put forth to the audience about acting from a moral standpoint and engaging in civic activity sort of relate to your motivation for the book and to your call for service? For me, it's a, a matter of communication when it's a book. But uh, when, you, when you communicate, your communication is much clearer when it comes from experience. Um, I was fortunate to grow up with my father, see him teach so many students and no fanfare around it. He'd be maybe in the, in the worst communities, maybe people would think it was bad, but then we didn't look at it like that. And um, he always had time to talk to people and he always addressed everyone with a certain humanity and a humility. And also my mother who, who was, a, was a social worker also, even though she, and she had a lot of kids and uh, we, didn't, we didn't have any material have any money but my mother was always she she was from the St. Bernard projects and she could she would go into people's homes and help them take care of their kids and, and do very basic fundamental things so I grew up in that type of environment and um, I've been fortunate to, to live a, a life where I could teach people and, and, and participate in the lives of, of people and go to schools and talk to students and also to play and to work so it's a uh, what I was talking about is the lessons you learn are not just symbolic or philosophical things, but those philosophies that have been tested and through action, your philosophy matures. And uh, the opportunity to express that in the book is uh, it's a blessing as is playing music, to, to be able to speak. Many musicians really can play, but they can't speak. Or uh, you can play, or you, maybe you can't teach. We all have different talents and skills. So. For me, it's a, I always could communicate. It didn't, wasn't in, a, in an educated setting when I first started having to communicate. Sometimes it was to communicate things of a profound and, 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 and abiding ignorance. But if you had the ability to communicate, you could survive in that environment also. So that's more what I'm talking about, the things that jazz culture has. I grew up in that culture, so even when I didn't like the music, I could understand how the musicians what they were saying. And uh, it's something that I, that I feel is important for us to know. Not because I'm saying it, but because it's a, it's a continuum of thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Response? Sorry. Can, you, can you say more about how jazz itself cultivates that kind of complexity that you alluded to? Like, what is it about the music itself that represents a cultural context that then you felt that really gave you a good foundation to? build on your own work? Well, I think even with the music, even the way you asked that question, the way you were pausing and waiting and to how you balance in your, your sentence, how you said to build on your own work. And you were building up to that last and the type of humility that is implied when you come down at the end of a sentence. There are many things that are in music. I noticed with Louis Armstrong, when he wanted to play a phrase and he wanted to really be, have a lot of humanity, he would come down. And I, I was thinking of a great film I saw of he and Frank Sinatra, where they were singing together, and, and, and they're singing, I'm confessing that I love you. And Louis Armstrong, Frank sings one chorus, and then Louis, Louis Armstrong comes, he says, I'm confessing that I love you, oh baby. And when he came down like that, Frank Sinatra went. <laughs> 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 and so I understood what he was saying, you know, being in a musical culture, Frank, he was saying, yeah, Louis Armstrong. You know, so, uh, the music, uh, there's so many things in the music. Let's just take the fundamental thing of the music is the thing that we have the most problem with in the West is the music forces you to hold two opposite thoughts in your mind. And it forces you to act on both of those things. Okay, and it's, it forces you to act on those things all the time. And also with the music, you're under the pressure of time. 
So you know you can't get a good lie together when you don't have time? That's what somebody starts saying, where were you? What time was it? Why did you come in? It? You need time. <laughs> so you know, the music is a certain way. You are pressured by time. Ding, ding, ding. Dude, the time is going all the time, and the harmonies are moving. So on the one hand, you're thinking about what am I playing, because you're the one that's playing. Then you have to think of what are they playing, because <laughs> you don't know what they're playing. And they're thinking, what are you playing? And they might play something and you change, and then they play something else and you have to change again. If you don't trust them, you immediately start thinking something that's not music. Why are they playing that? Now you don't sound good. This is how much attention the music requires. The second you lose your focus on the music, start, start concentrating on a judgment about a decision someone else made, you've lost your concentration, your train of thought, and you're not gonna, like, you know, we're talking about the, the Patriots game, you know, everybody wants to blame Wes Welker. But you have to realize Wes Welker is running in a certain direction. So what he maybe thought for a second was, why is he throwing the ball behind me? Right. That made him miss it. Right, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it's, well, sure, it's like you got to realize how fast it's going. And just that one thought, like, because now he's not thinking about let me catch it. He's thinking, I don't believe he threw that behind me. Now you missed it. And the music is that way. Mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> Responses, anymore? Well, there were so many in? things uh, in Wynton Marcellus's colloquium, performance, creation last mm -hmm. night um, that I think, you know, we can think about as educators as being missing from most education in classrooms. And one of the things that I thought, when you said two things coming together that are opposites, there's so many boundary crossings that you talked about last night, the sacred and the secular you know, was one that just kept on coming up, that one of the ways in which I think we don't let the spirit into most of our classrooms, the opportunities for this, the, the sort of spiritual encounters that are there, you know, in music. Um, but there were all kinds of other ways in which music, you talked about African and Anglo music coming together. And so those kinds of boundaries that we tend to create, uh, categories that we tend to create, that you say are hard for people in the West, right? right? To bring together that seem to be contrary and opposites. It seems to me one of the tasks of good education is really living with the coexistence of these opposites, right. bringing them together, embracing them, and out of that coming a kind of creativity. That does, that does happen with the kind of trust between people, mm -hmm. um, with considering the people that you're in ensemble with are worthy. They can carry their weight. And the other thing you talked about, which I loved most of all, uh, was the rhythm section. Oh, you know, yeah. the rhythm section, the place that, where democracy takes place, you said, um, and where there is both expressiveness and inclusiveness. And I think to find in our classrooms the opportunities for the rhythm section to go. And, and if the rhythm section is there, then the melodies and the music right. can prosper. So I think that there were so many both metaphors and illusions and historical evidence that you brought out that I think are really important for us as educators, teachers and learners in schools and out of schools to think about as the conversation has become so mechanistic and reductionistic um, and really needs to be much broader and much more dimensional. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I thought of a similar aspect of this. You know, we talk a lot about in the moral development world and around here about perspective taking and empathy, but you know, perspective taking is a cognitive experience, but it's also very much an emotional, empathy is really an emotional and spiritual experience mm -hmm. as well. And in schools, I think we have tended to focus on perspective taking, but we really haven't focused on empathy as an emotional and spiritual experience and how to really integrate the more cognitive experience with that emotional and spiritual experience that you're describing. And it just got me thinking about how to reproduce this experience of deep listening to music, deep listening to each other that you have in, in jazz and music in a classroom. Right. Well, I, I think that it's, uh, it's that we have, the, we have, we have, a, we have the, the truth of the things backwards, which is that the mechanics of the thing should always come later. It's like the way we learn how to speak a language. We didn't know what a verb was when we used them. But if we start teaching the verb first and the gerund and the noun, the, you'll never learn that. <laughs> you know, you're much better just listening to somebody speak and then you start speaking. You see, so 
the teaching is that, is that same way we all have learned. Most of the stuff we learned, we did not learn in a classroom. Everything from just the way that we speak to one another, or just, we could have we all been in, in, in elementary school together. We learned a whole pile of stuff that wasn't what we learned in math. And there's mathematics, just the way we unfold our sentences. It's, lingu it's, it's melodic and mathematic. We balance it naturally. But I think sometimes because, because I, I, I always think about the Tower of Babel, the myth in the Bible. It's interesting that the people were already together, but being together wasn't enough for them. They wanted to build a monument to them being together. <laughs> so <laughs> the punishment was he, they got scattered. So. If we could just recognize what we are when we teach students, it's, it becomes much easier. But a lot of times, because we we feel like we have to be the ones, we have to build a monument. We, yeah, we have to be the ones. I'm teaching you, and I'm showing you this. Well, you know, I'm showing you a little bit of what you're gonna learn. You learn more <laughs> from your neighbor, some guy, from some kid that beat you up when you were in third grade. You learn more then than you're gonna learn from me. Yeah. You know, I, I always give kids a. So the first time I ever really got beat up, because I would beat people up. But when I first really got beat up the first time, that was one of the most profound. <laughs> <laughs> that was an education. And the, and the first education was that it didn't have to stop when you said stop. OK, that's the first thing I just did. <laughs> I said, OK. And the second thing is you never, I never hit another person that same way after that. Because what, I mean, you know, because I grew up in that environment where you had to handle yourself. But before, I would hit people with relish. Yeah, man. After that, I always thought, hmm, <laughs> this eye socket is going to take about four months to heal. It just changes your perspective. And, that's, and, and it's, it's what I mean by the experiential part of education. And it, it goes with what you're saying, but we have a tendency to, to think we can separate things that cannot be separated. And I always go to the music of Bach. Uh, to talk about that because Bach was a person that had such a deep and, and profound abiding love for music. And his music is so unbelievably perfect and well crafted that you would think he started from the standpoint of a craftsman, but he didn't. He started as someone with a deep love of music. And it is that love and the feeling for it and love of those traditions that led him to that level of technical mastery. It's never the other way around when you get to that level of, of greatness. Beethoven. You know, these are people who were so engaged with what their music could do. And I mean, I'm, I'm going outside of the jazz tradition because they've been great musicians and artists in every tradition, but I don't, do you, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, it's like that love is first. And if that's not there, nothing is there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I wanted to come back to something that um, Sarah raised, but you also talked about it last night, which is the relationship that you have to the other musicians and the fact that sometimes when you're composing, you just put their name down <laughs> and rely on whatever it is that they're going to come up with. And that's so antithetical to what we do in higher education. That is, we, we don't really teach people to collaborate and to trust the other people that they're collaborating with, in part because I don't think everyone has a shared mission. They have right. a personal mission, which is to excel and compete and succeed individually. Mm -hmm. And right. so this idea of both moral agency and of um, civic engagement seemed to be at the heart of what right. you were talking about in terms of music. So the question is, why does it work in music and not in education? Well, it generally does not work in music. <laughs> 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 it generally it doesn't. Okay, and even last night, we, we, have it, we had it on our bandstand. And that's, that's because, it's once again, the, the two opposites. It's like those opposites. When, I'll give you a concrete example in, in music. When, when I was 27 or 28, I had the opportunity to play in a band with musicians who had played in Duke Ellington's band. And they were 78 and 79 and 82 and 83. So we went on the road with a group of, many of the men that I played with last night were in that group. <laughs> okay, and we were then 27, 28. These, these gentlemen were in that, and all of them have passed away now. This was 1991 or something, 20 years ago. The old men 
will always cuss us out and say, you all are playing too loud, too loud, too loud, too loud, <laughs> too loud. So what happened is being around them forced you to play softer. Then when you play softer, you could hear what somebody else was playing. The great Frank West, tenor saxophone player, played with bassist bands. He's still alive. He would always turn with some expletives and say, too loud. <laughs> and one point he would always make is, he would stop and say, can you hear what I'm playing? <clears throat> of course the answer is no. <laughs> and the thing that, that, that we always talk about is why are we sitting in a, in a 10 foot area and people have monitors? So this is how it normally works in music. Give you like a breakdown of a typical jazz band stand. Two horns are in the front, they have two monitors. Piano player's right there, he or she has a monitor. Bass player has an amp, the drummer doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> we start to play a song. Everybody then looks at the monitor person over there and says, turn me up. So the monitor person is turning up the piano, turning up the bass, and the drummer is just playing loud as possible. Then the bass player turns around and turns his amp up. Now the bass and the drums are playing really, really loudly and the horn players are pressing their horns and they're playing loud. Now we have the freedom to solo as long as we wish, so we start soloing. And the rhythm section does a thing when you've played too long, we call it breathing. When they get to the top of the form, they play and they go <laughs> It's like they can't, they can't it's like, just like you sigh when a person talks too long. <laughs> then the rhythm section does that. So a horn player now has, the rhythm section has sighed two or three times. And that, that horn player is just getting out, let's say at a jam session, there may be eight horn players. This is what I've seen for years. The, the, each horn player will play longer than that first horn player. So by the time you get to that eighth horn player, <coughs> now the rhythm section starts to drop out. The bass player drops out first all the time. They get tired. It's, okay. <laughs> the drummer's playing so loud, he doesn't care. <laughs> Then the tenor saxophone player plays. Well, forget about it. They never get tired. Trumpet players get tired. They're playing. And then 45 minutes has passed, and the song is over. That's normally how a jam, a jam session would go all over the world. On our bandstand, we battled for years with this, it, even in the sound checks. I was like, man, we cannot sit in this hall and play this loud and sound good. It's not possible. So we also. Uh, there's a certain empathy between us just because we've known each other for, for many years. Lucky Peterson, I met him, we were 23 or 22 or something. You know, Hurlin, I played in a band with him. I was eight and he was 13. He played trumpet, the, our drummer. Veal, we, he's, you know, we're all from the same place. Doug Womble, I met, he was 17 or 18. Now he's early, Lord, his uncle. <laughs> so when we, we've already, that's why he told the joke about me asking him to turn his guitar up, because my whole life I've been right, saying, right. Turn the guitar down, man. So they all know. And uh, we, we, when we sit down there, the thing that we're all pursuing is what's called the swing, the groove. We do have an objective that's not us. There's us, there's what we play, then there's the feeling of all of us playing together, and then there's the groove, which is the time and how it feels as it passes. And we realize that we are custodians of the time, but the time is out here. And we have to always, it's like the, the, and what the time in the music represents it's like the ideology of a country. Like our, our balance of powers and our, the things that we have to, 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 so that our country can, can work, those things are guided by principles. And those principles are not, they're written down, but they're not really written down. And it's the spirit of those principles that guide how you behave. And when you start to violate those principles, then you kinda, you know, all is, all is lost. It's like, why is a fugue the way it is? Because it is. But despite all of the sort of internal conflicts, <laughs> at the same time you've been playing with the same people over a long right. period of time, so you've clearly worked out some, some relationship right. that values the collaboration. Well, we love each other. Okay, for the first thing is that we don't play together now all the time. We have a deep kind of love and feel. We call each other all the time. Our kids have grown up. They know each other. Hurlin, Veal, I mean, we're like brothers. It's not, it's not, it's un, 
uncommon. The young lady who was singing, Brianna Thomas, she never worked with us ever. She came to the first rehearsal and she was nervous. And I have a tendency, I'm very hard on young people when they first come around me. And I do it on purpose, like I'm trying to test them. So I know that they're kind of scared, so I, I kind of just... Take advantage. You know you are. <laughs> yeah. I do, I, I take, because I'm, I'm trying to test them. So I, I told her, I said, you know you're out of tune? You know you're sliding into all of your notes? You know, I'm very direct. Like jazz musicians would be direct. Like I, I, my first experience playing with Mel Jackson <clears throat> and the great musicians, I played at McKell's and they played a slow blues. And when I finished playing, Mel Jackson asked me, he said, you notice the difference between how it sounded when you wasn't up there and how it sounded when you... <laughs> So I said, yes, sir. He said, you know what the difference was? I said, no. He said, you wasn't up there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, it's just a part of, our, it's part of our culture. It's like either you ready for this or you not. Or my daddy had a thing that he would always do to you, and he would say, son, what are you playing? <laughs> and he would wait for you, to, for you to answer him. And then if you didn't say nothing, he would ask you again, what are you playing? You'd be like, You know, music. Is it that what you call what you're doing? <laughs> so we have that. So with the young lady, I was kind of messing with her. I know that she took notes. I talked about go listen to Ethel Waters, sing notes on the head, check this out, do this, this with your phrasing. You got to listen to these people. She came back two days later. I was like, girl, you for real? Like, you are serious about, about this? Come be around this. Come to these rehearsals. Come participate in what we're doing. Be a part of this, get in this vibe. Don't be, before we went out on the stage, she was nervous. And I came and I said, you have to understand that for us, we look at you like you're our daughter or something. We've been out there a long time. But we, we are not, this is not a, like a, a performance for us. This is our way of life. We, we want you to be a part of it in that way. So don't be nervous. Don't worry about nothing. If you have a problem with something, you look over at me. Something goes wrong, we're gonna stop. Because when we get on a bandstand, it's spiritual. And anything that gets in the way of that spirituality will mess it up. So I want you to understand, as a young person, you have nothing to worry about. You're in mother's arms. See, what, what I love about this, and what I think is so important for us as educators, is you get, the context is, first of all, collaboration. The assumption that you need each other. You do need each other. Oh, yeah. The, the skill that happens when you have the rhythm of being able to work together for a long time, but also the mentoring relationship of what it means to and, and welcome new people into this collaboration with high expectations. You take them seriously. Oh, yeah. You expect that they can rise to a standard that is really yes. imp an important one. And, and for me, what I think is so important about this framework or metaphor for education is that we, we don't, as much as we should, involve and invite our students in any context of any classroom to collaborate, to assume they come into the classroom with valuable information that they can share. We too often in education think that we, the teachers, we, the professors, know something that we have to impart right. on them. And, and not only does that squelch their own voice and creativity, but it doesn't involve the expectation of collaboration. Right. And I think if we could think about transforming our educational systems to look at shaping a, a set of questions about what do we need to be educating for in this complicated, morally wrought world hmm. and what kind of role are our students going to be able to play assuming they will play a role as moral agents and assuming that that's part of the expectation of what we should be doing in education is to inspire them and to help create a habit of heart and mind that will that they will leave our institutions with a sense of both uh, tools as well as um, assumptions that they can and should be making a difference. Oh, and this is not, oh sorry Lonnie, this is not um, just about talk. It's about action. Yeah. Uh, it's not just about creating spaces for discourse. It's about right. moving yeah. Yeah. and that's, that's um, so having important. an impact and behaving. And I just remember 10 years ago, uh, Winton came to Harvard. And um, my son, this is, this is one of my favorite stories of all time, uh, uh, was on the bandstand playing. This is when you were visiting lots and lots of high schools and working with lots of high school bands. And my son was a senior at Boston Arts Academy, public school here in Boston. And uh, he was in their top, you know, top group. And so he was on the bandstand. He's a drummer. 
now you see where I'm going here. <laughs> Dr. Wayne. And uh, so <laughs> this group was playing, and as they were playing their opening number, suddenly the sound got bigger and richer <coughs> and more resonant and stronger. And then you noticed Wynton Marsalis had come from behind on the stage, just sort of very subtly, and he was there. And the music came, right? But it was this gorgeous thing of seeing this big master of music, this hero of ours, right, playing with these other guys all together, you know, this sort of communal, creating community. Um, and then the and he, teaching and he, started. And, he, and he's leading and following. And he's right? leading and following, yeah. right? He's just yeah. one on the. He's just one of the yeah. horns back there. Yeah. It's a small group. I think there was only maybe two yeah. other horns. Yeah. And then the teaching starts, where Winton begins to dissect my sons because he's going after the drummer who always plays too loud. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> my sons play, and it is excruciating um, in terms of the sort of rigor and <coughs> discipline and judgment. <coughs> Right? Yeah, yeah. It's excruciating, and my son keeps his cool and keeps going and going. And it's and with so much appreciation, right? Because that's where the respect is, right? Yeah, yeah. You can do it. I know you can do it. You are worthy, right? Yeah. You can be a fine musician. And afterwards, Winton said to me, I could have kissed your son. And I said, well, why? And he said, because he listens. Uh, he's right? lovable. He's, he's lovable and he listens, right? So, so this business of listening as being such so much a part, not just of music, but of teaching um, um, and, and part of this empathy that you were talking about. You've got to listen to yeah. people around you. But, and, yeah. but I think there's another aspect, which is that your son was there not just to impress um, Winton, but no. to produce something. That's right. right. And what's That's different right. in right. our classrooms is that we are not relying on our students to produce That's anything. Right. We're simply measuring them. Right, right. 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 I right. think that's very important to have an activity. Like I went the other day to teach some three-year-olds. So the teacher said, well, maybe you should teach for, for five minutes. I said, oh, and I've been teaching my whole life for 40 minutes. It won't be a problem, you know. I taught elementary school kids. I've been, when I got in the room, I understood. <laughs> it should have been five minutes. <laughs> See, I didn't understand. This lady knows. She's in here with these three-year-olds. She's telling me, look, man, you need to do five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, what, try to teach a group of three-year-olds? <laughs> so I was, you know, looking at the, I thought, I, I need to have some activities. And I feel like for us drawing adult lives, we need activities right. to, to give us experience, you know. And so that, that is, a tool, I think, the most important tool of teaching that we don't use. Every class should have some type of activity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that activity, because you're not, I mean, you, you want to be able to understand the power of the collective. That right. is the most powerful thing in the human, in the universe of us, is that you put a man and a lion out on the plains, that man is in a world of trouble. <laughs> but you put 10 men out and 200 lions, the lions are in trouble. Because, boy, those 10 men are going to figure something out. <laughs> two of them is going to know something. And that two is going to tell the other eight, y'all do this. They're going to do something. They'll figure something out. But it's like we that collective power in a classroom. Yeah. Yes. When you did mention, when you talked about the trust factor between you and the people in your group that you've known for a long time, and then you talked about, is it Tiffany? Was that, what was the young woman's name? Who Brianna. Was Brianna, Brianna, who came in last night and you uh, were hard on her in the beginning. But you used a word, you talked about your spirituality right. in, in your teaching. And could you talk a little bit more about that? Because that's also something that when we talk about teaching, that that's a word that oftentimes we shy away from. So I'd like you to talk about that a little bit more. What role does that play? That's and then also tied into civic engagement. How does that play a part in cultivating that? Well, I think that that's really everything in, in, in life is that. I always like to tell, my, like I, I remember my grandmother, my great aunt, you know, they were all maids. And they were very poor people. And uh, didn't, they didn't talk that much. My grandmother might have told me maybe 1,500 words in my entire life. She never mm -hmm. talked. She was very, very humble. Mm -hmm. My great aunt could just cook, 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 was very, didn't talk. 
And my great uncle was born in 18, 1883. I lived with him for, for a year when I was six and other times whenever something would happen. You know, it wasn't the old day something happened. You didn't know what happened, but you were somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> but what I learned from them was just a certain type of spirituality. You know, they, they had very hard lives, but I can just remember how my great aunt would look at me. And a lot of times with students, you know, they, they, we're in that period where you can't touch students or you can't, but I'm from that tradition. <coughs> Maybe somebody's playing, I go over to them. I would go to the, to the schools with the, with, the, with the most ignorant kids that had the most problems. And I'd be like in West Chicago or something, and they would say, oh, these kids are, so I would go to like the roughest kids or the ones who I knew were the most problem. And I would put my hand on that kid and start talking and they would knock it off. And I would put my hand on, I would start talking to them like we're talking. And then we start to look at each other. And many times that kid would start to cry. Mm. Because those kids, right. that's all a front. Mm -hmm. And once they can feel my hand and the spirit, first they know the experience. Then they understand, they want a man to, to love them so badly. That's what all that anger and hostility is, that lack of kind of male leadership. When you put that on a person, and it has the type of intention that's real, that's serious, that has been earned through time, it's real, and they feel it. And uh, I believe in that's the teaching method. Now, my father was the type of person who would never touch you. He was awkward hugging me. He's not a toucher. Mm -hmm. But still, you knew he loved you. So whether he was teaching Harry Connick or Reginald Veal, who played bass last night, I remember my father calling me saying, man, I found, <coughs> I found a bass player. This guy's named Reginald Veal. You got to hear him play. So when I first heard Veal play, he was still playing like he was playing electric bass. I was like, man, what you talking about? This guy's playing like electric bass. But he said, just wait, man. Because he can see into the, and I think with our students, we all have something. Every person, you might not be a great musician, but you have something. You have something that's creative, and you have a thing that you want to say. You have something you, and as teachers, we, all, we have that added responsibility to find that thing and touch that. Because our job ultimately is to teach. It's not to grade. It's not right. to judge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's to teach. Mm -hmm. And teaching is the humblest thing that you could think, I have something, I'm going to share it with you, and I'm going to free this thing with you. But for me to free something in you, I have to harmonize with you. Last night, Lucky Peterson and I, we hadn't played together in years. And you know, it's hard out here for somebody who's, who has the type of talent he has to put his talent in a kind of pop context. He can't be successful because that's not really who he is. So he was, after he sang Precious Lord, we looked at each other, and we got to like a vibe, and I almost got full because it was all of that and what he was singing and playing because he was playing it a certain way. And we looked at each other for a long time after that and I didn't say nothing. Then when we went downstairs, he said, man, you know, when I was looking at you, I almost got full, man. I had to turn away and pretend like I had something in my head. <laughs> I said, you know, I got full too, man. We did too. You know, because it's a, mm -hmm. it's a spiritual thing and everything has that spiritual, you know, and it's, it, cause the distance between the greatest person who's been, and the person who knows that it's a very small distance. None of us know anything really. If you take the what is to be known, we're all very, <laughs> we're on this level. And it's more that, that feeling is all we actually can communicate. And if we fail to communicate to our, that to our students, we have failed as teachers. That was the moment last night, precious Lord. Yeah, that's my oh man. Oh my gosh. You know, when he did his he thing, was. so we looked at each other like, okay, man. Because yeah. it's been hard for, for, for him out here. You know, yeah. it's hard for anybody who has a real talent that don't want to just completely sell out. It's just difficult, it's just, and we're talking about 30 years of hard, not a week of hard, <laughs> we're talking about hard. Okay, for me, I was lucky. I, for some reason, I had something that allowed me to be able to become known and not have to sell out that much. But, I mean, for most of the time, you're playing music in, in our culture. If you really can play, what are you gonna do? What does it mean to sell out? It means that you have to play beneath your talent and you have to put what you actually think in a context that's beneath you. And it, we all have to do it in different ways or do it, some don't do it. You know, it was really, when you don't do it, you have to be ready to face the criticism first of your peers, of your colleagues, you have to face years of blistering, critical assessment of what you're doing and you have to be prepared for it. And it's not easy, believe me, it's not. 
It's not, it's not easy. And then you have doubts and you, you know, you have, but you're putting your art before a public that's not, doesn't necessarily want to hear it. And you know what they want to hear is Lil Wayne or whatever. I mean, whatever, you can pick whoever. It's not just Lil Wayne. I mean, it's, I feel bad for Lil Wayne. It's not even his fault. <laughs> and, and I don't even, I don't even mean it that way. You know what I mean? I don't mean it. In it. I feel bad for us because he is a manifestation of us. So when I look at him, I look at any of them, I look at a guy on the stage with like his, his daughter and the songs they sing, and I'm thinking to myself, mm, our culture, something is wrong with us. And it's not about him. So, you know, it's just, so for, as a musician, it's, it's been rough. It makes me think, too, about the difference between um, reproducing what we already know and living in the cutting edge of our consciousness and, and imagination. And, mm. and again, the role of musicians in that, I think, is so critical because you, you have to link. You have to link with culture. Right. You can't just be so far out. That's right? right. But how do you stay right in the edge so that you're keeping sharp yourself but also inviting others to grow rather than just stay stagnant? I think, you know, everything is just a, is a balance. Like, my, my, I have a 23-year-old son, and he, we, we had an art exhibit, and he started laughing. He was looking at some of the artwork. He said, yeah, this is good, man, but it's all about the person who did it. He said, why does he need me? <laughs> he, said, he, said, he, don't, he don't need me to participate in it. I'm, so I think that, you know, it's like you're having a dialogue with many things. That's why I always like to go back to somebody like Bach. I just return to Bach when I have these questions about music. Here's a guy who is the greatest musician in the world who gets, gets demoted in his job for writing the St. Matthew's Passion. Okay, I'm thinking, okay, he's at the end of his career. He's not a young man. He gets his job. They say, we want you to write music that's not too long, that's not too difficult for our boys to sing, and that doesn't have a lot of ornamentation in it. Handel is a big, you know, as a, as a, he wrote the Messiah. Everybody's talking about Hondo. And he was on his last legs too. You know, he, he broke, but he. And here's Bach. He's ended up teaching at a boys' school. He's written all of, and, and he writes the St. Matthew's Passion. And he tries to get a group of boys to sing that, which I, I wonder what that sounded like. <laughs> like they, I mean, come on. Really? I don't know. I needed some great boys back then, but I, I think they're gonna have a hard time. And just the first first section of that piece is so unbelievably great and complex and so rich with so much information. He's channeling so much from we don't know where. Like, what makes a person do something like that in that situation? And he got demoted. I mean, nobody wanted to hear it. It was whatever it was, two hours or something. They said, don't write anything long. And uh, it's, it's, that, it's, that, it's, it's that, that impulse, that I mean, it's, it's, it's that thing, so I, I don't know. And, and, and courage, it takes courage. Yeah. You have to want to incorporate people into a worldview that's on the, on the edge of a, like he's trying to take them to something, but he also was the most traditional person too. Like he was so good that the, older, the oldest organist alive in Germany at that time had to admit that he could play. Now that's a lot, because boy, the oldest don't never like to admit the youngest can play. <laughs> and they would hear him play and say, damn. I just want to add a question for you. Um, so this is something I've read about a lot. I think, I think people tend to care about people within their circle of concern. So corporate executives can care a great deal about other cor corporate executives. And greedy corporate executives can have <laughs> right. empathy for other greedy <laughs> right. corporate executives. I hope I haven't offended any greedy <laughs> corporate executives. <laughs> um, but the issue is often, and I think they're being, and they often can be very ethical within their circle of concern. The issue is, how do you really have empathy for people outside your circle of concern or develop that empathy? And how do you morally inspire people to care about people who are outside their circle of concern? And I know from some, some of your writings, this is something you've thought about, and you've thought about the power of music to do that. And I just wonder if you could talk about it a little bit. Well, you know, I think just, for me, it goes even more basic than that. Like, we, we all have a basic, I've been, I've been fortunate to be in many places in the world. And I have to say that I've never been in a place of all of the places where I felt that the basics of humanity did much of what you, much of what you, you don't even remember being taught, are always in place. Mm -hmm. Like, you go into somebody's house and the mother is the one who pulls the pictures out. 
Why? I don't think I've seen one father in 30 years pull pictures of his family out <laughs> in, their, in their home, not on a phone or not a, it's always like the mother or, if you smile at somebody and you're nice, they're generally gonna be nice to you. If you say thank you and you wait and you are patient and you show a certain type of warmth and, and love to people, they will generally show that to you. If, you. if you listen and try to figure out what they're saying and don't think you know, they will explain it to you. If you ask them a question and you follow it up with another question, another question, they'll tell you. And I think these are fundamentals that we all know. And you know, everybody's accomplished. We all have worked in our fields. We all have come up with things. We have things that we, but we also have had to rely on other people a lot. And we all have mentors and teachers and people that have supported us and that love us and that we love. And I think that it's such a basic cycle. Empathy is such a basic thing to human beings. If not, we would be all really killing each other. Most of the killing that goes on is not on a personal level. <coughs> you think about a lot of killing that goes on on our planet, it's mass killing. It's ideological, it's not personal. You know, if you grew up in the street, they would say if you rob somebody, don't look at them. You're robbing them, you don't want to look at them because if you're looking at them, you, then it becomes a personal issue. So I think that you know the whole kind of question of what, how personal things are, we all understand that. You and I right now, we just looking at each other, man. We, okay, we in a panel discussion, but if we were just sitting on a plane talking, we'd just be talking, yeah, man, where are you from? What happened? Yeah, well, you know. Man, you know, my, when my son was blah, 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 so I just said, yeah, man, you know, give me your card. Yeah, we got to go get lunch. So I just said, yeah, man, you remember so I'll have lunch with you anytime. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? It's just a natural kind of thing. And this could, we, we, could be, we could be in Japan or we could be, we could be anywhere. I mean, people, people want to know other people. We just have to not be afraid of people. You know, don't, we don't need to be afraid of people. What do you think about the power of music to do it, though, and a blues man, you know, to do yeah, it? Yeah, man, music is, I, I wish, I'd like to tell stories about music. I was in Germany when I was like 23 or something. I was on a tour going through Europe, and I really didn't, I wanted to be home. You know, I was playing classical music, so I was by myself. And I felt like I was the only black person in Germany. <laughs> I would go into places, check in the hotel. So I had two stories that happened, like back to back. One, I was r driving to a town, Macht Oberdorf, from, from, uh, from Munich. I was uh, playing a Haydn trumpet concerto and I, I got in a car at like 12 o'clock at night with a guy. And I had a tape, a cassette tape of Thelonious Monk. So I was trying to talk to the guy, but he wasn't saying nothing. You know, he was so I started to create all these scenarios about the man. Man, this guy, don't want to talk to me. <laughs> it's like to the driver maybe three hours, you know. So we got into the hotel at three o'clock and I left my tape in the car. And the tape, it was the type of cassette tape that would flip over and over. So, the, so, so Monk was just playing the whole time. So I got out of the car and started checking in the hotel and I forgot my tape in the car. So the man, a few minutes passed, then the man came into the hotel and I saw him, I said, what is this? He gave me the tape, when he gave me the tape, he said, Monk. So I thought, now, all of what I thought about this man him listening to Monk was not one of them. <laughs> okay. And another time I was at a club after a classical gig, and members of the orchestra said, hey, would you come go play some jazz for us? You know, because sometimes I would play with the orchestras, and after the gig they would say, there's a good club down here, will you go play? We just want to hear you play, you know. So I went down to this club, and I was, I was playing something. I didn't sound that good, I was trying to play. So it's an old guy sitting down around 1.30 or something in the morning, he was just saying the same thing over and over again. I ain't blues. I ain't blues. Mm -hmm. Then he said, in English, could you please play one blues for me? <laughs> so it's just like oh, we're in the middle of somewhere in Germany and here's somebody asking me to play some blues. Mm -hmm. And it's the universality of the blues as a language. I was once in Turkey playing uh, at, at a festival. We were in an outdoor theater, a guy comes up with some instrument, I didn't even know the name of it. I was just looking at it, he wanted to play with us. Are you gonna play that? <laughs> he said, yeah, so I, I introduced him, he came. I said, what do you wanna play? He said, blues, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ted Nash is a, a, a saxophone player in our orchestra. We're around the same age. His father's a great musician, played trombone on a lot of movies and stuff you've heard. He comes from a great family of musicians. His father's maybe pushing up on, on 80. He comes up on the bandstand in Los Angeles to play. We say, what you want to play, Mr. Nash? Blues. A guy who played trombone in Lawrence Welk's band 
introduces himself. We're playing a gig in Atlanta. He wants to come sit in with the band. He comes up. He put, what you want to play, man? Blues, man. You know, I could go on and on and on just about the blues. When you get to the blues, it's like everybody can. Mm -hmm. So that's how our music, American music, through the blues, we all, people understand the blues all over the world. Mm -hmm. And they love it. And when you can play the blues, they love you. Because mm -hmm. it makes them, you know. Because it's suffering and, it, and it's hope, too. Right? It's, that's, that's exactly it. It's suffering and it's hope. And that's what life is. Yeah. Like, man, we out here. Damn, that happened. And, and yeah, last night you also said that blues tell a story. Yeah. And I think yeah. the ways in which yeah. stories capture people's attention and we can identify with the characters yeah. in the story. We have felt that, too. So that it becomes a universal story. It, yeah. Yeah. And you know, you, like uh, Ch oh, Chuck Berry is an example. I didn't really like Chuck Berry that much. I'm a trumpet player. I don't really electric guitars. They took, they took our place. We don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> I have to be honest about it. That's why, Doug, that's why Doug and I are joking a lot between each yeah. other. Mm -hmm. Until I sat down at a table with Paul Simon and he started to recite Chuck Berry's lyrics the way that they hit him when he was a teenager. That's why I recited those lyrics of Johnny B. Good. He started to roll out Chuck Berry. Man, what about Chuck Berry's lyrics? Blah, 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 blah. Boom, boom, boom. Song after song. He just was, he said, come on, man. That's great stuff. I said, okay, man. He's still a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> I am aware of the time, and I know that, Lonnie, you said you had to leave around 11. It's actually 10 after 11. So okay. what we're going to do now is um, we could go on like this forever, I'm sure. Um, listening to this wonderful dialogue and discussion. And what I'd like to do now is take a pause, and I promised you that I was going to give you an assignment. And so in the spirit of spirituality <laughs> and trust, we are going to do a turn and talk. We're and, and having an activity, right? All right. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn to the person next to you, and if you're sitting far away from someone, if you could move over so that you can sit and have a conversation. I want you to talk about what you've heard and see if you can come up with a collective <laughs> question, a question that you would like to ask. We have the mics. I'm going to give you about sort of five, eight minutes to do that, and then we'll start our Q&A period. Okay? Make sure you introduce yourself to the person next to you and uh, come up with a question. Okay? Hi. And let's first thank Lonnie Guineer before Lonnie has to leave. <laughs> Okay. It's a great trumpet part too. <gasps> so hopefully you have had an opportunity to talk a little bit about what you've heard. And now we'll entertain some questions from the audience. So why don't we start here? Please say your name. Uh, and what I will ask is that, uh, as my colleague Richard Elmore would say, no throat clearing first. In other words, no long you know, introduction to the question, because we really want to get as many questions as, as we can. So if you could go straight to the question after you say your name, I would really appreciate that. Okay? And I will do something about it if you don't. Okay? So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Michael. Um, Winton, uh, very powerful comments, and thank you. And I couldn't help thinking with every story from the educational experience of getting beat up for the first time to getting dressed down on the bandstand by Mel Jackson, how you create jazz culture in the classroom, how you make it real, how you get kids, especially in West Chicago, to care. I mean. You come there and you've got this great spirit and they feel it when it's on their shoulder. But God help the classroom teacher who's trying to make that connection. So these lessons are so powerful, but how do you bring education into school? I think, uh, uh, thank you for the, the question, but I, I feel like a teacher who's an everyday teacher, I, I always talk with the, with the teachers, you know, and uh, I really, I wish I was an everyday teacher. But I look at it like I look at how you raise your kids. Now, it's difficult because you're dealing with kids many times who have not had the, who have not, their parents have struggled. And 
if the thing that really could help those kids is if their parents had jobs. It's not the emotional trauma of people not being together and all of that. That's a, it's always been a part of life. But it's like the economic situation hurts them. Now you're there. Okay, I've had a lot of my uh, colleagues when I was younger who became teachers. So this is a question that they ask me many times in, from their classroom. What would you do? One teacher, I will say, use her particularly as a story. It was not a music class. It was an English class. She said, I can't get my children to read. And then when I deal with their lives and their parents, it's such horrific stories. A stepfather comes in, he wants my phone number. And the mama is there and the kid sees it on the computer, story after story. The kids get involved in something where they go into the park and to do some, some of them, a couple of them go to jail. Okay, so she said, can you come to my classroom? Her class, her, her class was in the morning. And I told her, okay, I can come to your class for two weeks. So every day in the morning, I went to her class. First, I got them dictionaries. Okay, we got dictionaries. Just look at it. You don't have to read nothing in it. Act like you, like you have read this. I'm just going to read these stories to y'all every day. We're going we're gonna to break the classroom time up into four sections, and we're going to deal with these things, and then you're going to read it. I don't care how sad your reading is. Now, the first day, of course, they don't want to do it. They're making fun. They're laughing. They're clowning. They're this, they're that. It's the every day of it. You grind them down. You don't let them grind you down. It's a long distance race. It's a long distance race. Long distance, long. And it goes way. So I always look at that with, with kids. You're in a tough situation. They have a tough situation. You're not going to be the psychiatrist. You can't be their father. You can't be their mama. But you can be that person who for one hour gave them something to take up. And that's a powerful symbol. That teacher is powerful. You know, I remember when my trumpet teacher cussed me out when I was 16 because I wasn't practicing. And I had the last lesson on Saturday, and all the younger kids sat outside of my lesson. He cursed me, and they could hear every word of it. And he told me, put your horn in the case and get out. And he was paralyzed because he had had a stroke. So he talked like that. You mm -hmm. couldn't understand what he said. He said, get out, get out, get out. <laughs> I had to put my horn in the case and walk out in front of all the younger kids. And they were looking at me like, <laughs> you know, so those are, those are the kind of lessons. With, the, with very difficult kids, you can't give them the type of tough love because they already have that. You got to give them the love love. And that means that you have to endure a lot and keep your intensity. So that's what I always kind of, to, to my young keep your intensity. You wear them down over time. And you'll think that you won't, but you will. Because they want somebody to do that. You know what I mean? And, and avoid getting beat up by them. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I'm serious, because once you, once I know a couple of teachers who got there behind with, by students, you got to walk that line. Because when that happens, the school cannot defend you you'll have to leave. Like once cousins and all that start getting involved, <laughs> that's a level of ignorance. You have, to, you have to walk that line where you don't get in a thing with kids where a physical thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think you, we mentioned the love love and that's really what I find works is when you wear them down with your love love. Yeah. Um, and not the tough love. And it's hard because they're tough. Mm -hmm. The kids who really have the dysfunctional upbringing, I'm not talking about the spoiled kids who are brats. You have to just slap them. <laughs> and by that, I don't, mean, I don't mean it physically. I don't, I don't, I don't, mean, yep. I don't mean physically hit them, but I mean you have to treat them with the same level of disrespect they're treating you with. And you have to engage them very directly. I do that all the time with kids and their parents. A, a young lady will come with her mother, and the mother will go to take a picture. Don't you take a picture of me. Like, what? You know, that's the one thing for the spoiled kids, I really don't tolerate that. In front of a stranger, too, I always make the point to them. So I try to put them in their situation. But, you know, that's another, that's another. The, the tough kids, the, the rough kids, that's different. You got to, because they're going to try you, and they're going to keep trying you. It won't be like a, a TV movie. <laughs> that's, you know, it's, oof, mm -hmm. that's work. Many of us believe that music and the arts are, uh, hold a key 
to salvation for individual children and for our society as a whole. But our society and the larger educational establishment isolate the arts as extracurricular and right. non-core. We have this common core, arts is nowhere near it. <coughs> what can we do to bring the arts back to the center? I think just proselytize, proselytize, proselytize. <laughs> you know, I always think kind of, of like somebody like Martin Luther King, 15 or 16, mad because he has to stand on a bus. He wants essay contest. He's still segregated. He says, I'm going to do something about this. He did something about it. And I think that we just have to process. The arts are there. Walt Whitman is here. Winslow Homer, they're there. They, they already did their job. You know, Gershwin, you can take your pick of so many of them that are great. But we don't know any of them, so we just have to proselytize. Just keep every time you get a chance, talk about it. Hey, teach it to kids. Let them know. Read to them. Stay with them. Make the Challenge them to be adults. In the political arena, proselytize. In the education arena, proselytize. Because the arts are, they, they are the symbolic guidance that we need. That's why we don't have good manners and no integrity. It's there for us, and, and we will come to it. We're just young, too, and ignorant. And you know, when you're young and ignorant, a lot of times, for a nation, it takes time, some tough lessons, but we have to proselytize. Other panelists, can, please respond. Yeah, can I just say, too, I think, I mean, I think one of the reasons that they are marginalized is because they're not considered core, because they're, they're, not, they're not quantifiable. The, the right. way that we can measure success in the arts isn't as quantifiable as it is in a math test. And I worry on a larger scale about the normative assumption now of quantifiable methods for universal uh, mm -hmm. merit. And that, I think, is a bigger question. And I think if we start, if we're proselytizing, I'm loving all this spiritual language, by the way. <laughs> if we're proselytizing about the arts, I think we need to w challenge this uh, quantifiable framework for, for what we can value also. Because yeah, so what's good about them is that they're not quantified. Yeah, exactly. That's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, I think there's a, I don't know, Mira was there I, and some of the others. The, we had the first iteration of the major Harvard initiative now for uh, teaching and learning that happened on Friday. And the very first panel was introduced by the, and the moderator of the very first panel spoke about how the notion of multiple intelligences or different kinds of learning is a myth. And I just thought, this is heartbreaking and really serious in relationship to these kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. We've got to challenge that set of assumptions. But can you, I just want to ask you a question about, can you, what do you think about the kind of metrical analysis of X kids took ban and they ended up, I mean, is there a, a way to assess metrically the health? Because this, this is an a, a issue that we're really struggling with. Do, uh, yeah, yes, and I, I don't want to say that all forms of quantifiable measurements are bad, but they're, but they're particular. And I do think we can also use those kinds of measurements to help make a case for the arts. And we've got a lot of that data out there. So I think that's another thing to just continue to promote um, about the health and the well-being and the welfare of kids who have that kind of exposure. But I find sometimes when I'm proselytizing, if I had really accurate metrical data, it doesn't even have to be yeah. accurate. <laughs> you know, Let's I'm, just make it up. I'm willing to make up some of it, but I have to be somewhere. I mean, you know, I have to have some I'm kind of, you, did you know that 70% of kids right. that <laughs> right. Right. played box music actually did better in That's right. Math. But do you, is there a place that I can go to get that type of metrical analysis? I think just doing what you're doing. Make it up. <laughs> Sound convincing. <laughs> no, I'm, but I'm, I'm serious. I'm, I, that's a legitimate no, question. Do you know, is there a place that... Yeah. There, there yes, is? Well, we do that. Steve, yeah. 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 Excuse yeah. me for being right. ignorant of it, but I mean, I'm, hey, I'm asking. I, uh -huh. But we can measure them. Is there is yeah. like a measurement of it? Is it? That's what I'm just asking. From a new if I could get my hand on it. No, but you see the problem with me is that you then, in doing that kind of measurement and trying to make it credible, you have to say this is the this one thing is 
right. reasons why the oh, world is the way it outcomes. That's right. And it's, yeah. and we know it's, it's a main thing. There's all kinds mm -hmm. of yeah. mm -hmm. different. But um, so there are lots of claims. So there's a lot of claims about the power of the arts to um, uh, influence academic outcomes. And a lot of those have been shown to not be so strong. So you have to kind of. We're making a case. Pick and and choose. <laughs> or, right. or say, okay, you know, that, that we just don't have that metric. But the, you know, I think that part of the important thing is to say, look, um, first of all, talk to kids who've had the experience and talk to kids who haven't. That's one thing. Another That's thing is to try to sort of sort out the many different kinds of benefits that um, are your motivation for doing the work. Hmm. That, and those are social, <coughs> those are spiritual, those are um, psychological, also, and I think, you know, one of the things that we never talk about kind of enough is the strength of a community. Yes, and right. One of the right. things that, and, and I know Elaine is, you know, deeply in this work and knows it better than, as well as anybody, that part of what happens is that schools, the quality of life yes. in a school changes mm -hmm. when communities, mm -hmm. when multiple micro communities around theater projects, dance projects, jazz ensemble are part of the, the regular mm -hmm. daily mm -hmm. performative mm -hmm. life of school. Mm -hmm. That's I think another way to think about it is to is is literacy terms. That's right. You know that my folks didn't believe we were educated unless we were literate in music, right? Mm -hmm. In music and in words. Uh, they were musicians and they were academics, but the idea was that that was a really central part of education and that our world would be opened up that much more if we had a literacy in that and had some kind of understanding of it and rigor in response to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, requiring mm -hmm. practice and all kinds of things like mm -hmm. that. So I think that, th that there are some, there, there's language there uh, that we use when we talk about education and intellectual development and even cognitive development that can be transposed beautifully onto arts literacy mm -hmm. and, and how that opens up for us in a very important way. Um, wider, deeper, mm -hmm. richer mm -hmm. understandings of the world in which we're part of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if we could get our toolkit together, mm -hmm. it would be like, I'm, I'm thinking of what he was saying about, what, you know, we talk about the question of activities, micro activities around, but if we had actual data I, I don't, maybe it exists, like a centralized place that would be like a toolkit. You, you, many times I'm sent out to proselytize, but I don't have any tools. I'm just coming with passion and uh, that's good, but it's well, better you with, can, some, with some tools. You can, okay, you can give. Of, um, a, there's a terrific volume called Critical Links, yeah. which can, looks at uh, the multiple okay. kinds of benefits of the arts. Yeah. Captured in, uh, you know, one of the other problems is that it takes a lot of money to do these studies. There isn't a lot of money to do this. So there are lots of little studies, and there have been some nice efforts to try to put those studies together and see what's the big picture that you get out of this mosaic mm -hmm. of information. Yeah, and I wonder what, what's going to, if anybody is going to be doing some work with Dudamal in Los Angeles with La Sistema, <coughs> because that's a project <coughs> where now they are uh, providing arts lessons and music lessons to young children. I don't know how many of you a few years ago heard when the Venezuelan Youth Orchestra came to Boston yeah. and blew the lid off of Symphony Hall yeah, right. uh, because not only was the music absolutely mm -hmm. extraordinary, again, the spirit that those young people mm -hmm. brought into that hall, you talk about being full. I think I cried for probably the entire uh, performance because it was just so rich in passion. So maybe that would be a way. Again, I've heard but, that Judemol might be tracking, but I'm not but sure. You, yeah, okay, the, the thing about, it's, it's interesting for me because when you, when you, Abreu is the, 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 they call him the old man. He's the one who started it. Mm -hmm. His system is really based on literature. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. like everybody is playing. Eight-year-olds are playing Sibelius symphonies. You know, it's like he, mm -hmm. in America, it's going to be interesting to see how it works. Because first, the level of parental involvement mm -hmm. and the, the, the funding will, will be there, but it's, it's, be, it's, it comes out of a certain system that the closest city, the closest things in America to that are in New Orleans, mm -hmm. ironically. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at what Dudamel and them are doing to, 
to, but Elsa STEM is unbelievable. When you see them, and I had the opportunity to, to go through the whole system with the old man himself. Whew. I mean, you hear all those orchestras play. You hear like nine-year-olds playing and orchestras playing Beethoven Third Symphony. <laughs> and they can play, too. It's not like... <laughs> So, but it's going to be interesting to see how it works in our country because we have a lot of diff completely different social situations that make it much more difficult to do here. Mm -hmm. um, yes, ma'am. Hi, um, good morning. My name is Joyce Lynn Wilson. I'm a Hip Hop Archive Fellow at the Du Bois Institute. And <coughs> my question is, goes back to the tightrope of the sellout. Um, mm. My research focuses on um, hip hop education, schooling, and leadership. And you mentioned Lil Wayne, and you mentioned him as an example of a generation that has somehow um, lacked some sort of cultural guidance. Right. And you also went so far as to say that it's not his fault. It's, it's not. not this generation's fault. Um, that somewhere, somehow, there was a drop ball. Right. And I'm assuming that you were implying that that was from the generation before. And one other thing you said was that the sellout was inevitable, that somehow everybody has to deal with that tightrope of decision making, that, that trying to keep it real at the intersection where different worlds are colliding. How do you teach young people about the sellout? How do you teach the etiquette <coughs> of the sellout to walk that tightrope so that the next generation of leaders are not having to deal with what you're seeing um, my generation having to deal with? Well, I think some people have integrity. And it's not a tightrope for them. Okay, for me, I would say that Betty Carter is a person I looked at when I was 17 or 18. Even when I was in high school, my friends always said I was a hardliner. I knew we weren't playing nothing even then, so it's not a matter of hip-hop. We're playing music that was okay, but I, you know, I was playing it. We enjoyed it, the Commodores, you know, we played funk music, we had our high water, high, our bell bottom pants on, our high shoes, our afros, we were singing, doing dance steps, we wasn't playing nothing. <coughs> we wasn't, every night, we, would do, we had light shows, we had dance steps, it was fun, but it wasn't about playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came to New York, it was like I looked around at all the musicians and people talking about, man, you need to do this, you need to do that, it's always something about some money. Betty Carter was about, you need to learn how to play. <laughs> so she started her, own, started her own record label. She taught all kinds of musicians how to play. She, she was unbelievable, just the force and power she had and the integrity she had about this music and about communicating that to people. She was completely uncompromising. So I would hold her in my mind always as like a symbol of integrity. And I think that our kids need symbols of integrity. And that goes across the board. I mean, that's, that's I feel a lot of a lot of teaching is symbolic, and there are always people with integrity. Then you then you're not on a tightrope. This is what I'm doing. And I've got Thelonious Monk is a person also in jazz. He played what he played. If you liked it, okay. If not, he played for the less people. He was okay. So just to follow up, so are, would you say that if it's not his fault that maybe? that generation didn't have models of integrity from the previous generation? That doesn't come from a generation. Me and my 16-year-old my, my son were on the phone this morning. He was asking me if I could find a book for him on the menstrual show. I said, yeah, there's a book by a guy named Toll called Blackening Up. Blackening Up. He said he's doing an art project where he wants to draw all of people of the menstrual show like Zip Coon and the dandy and all, and he's gonna equate all of them to rappers, and he's gonna name all the rappers the, the menstrual images. I told him, look for a guy named Billy Cursons. It's a great picture of him as one of the New Georgia menstruals after the Civil War, because there's a great, I forget what the term is for the kind of, not a, not a lithograph, but the kind of image that they used to print of him smiling and frowning at the same time. And the emotion in that face shows like what being a minstrel was about. Mm -hmm. So Lil Wayne type characters who entertain the country, if you looked at the Super Bowl and you saw the one mm -hmm. commercial with Flav, that was the minstrel right there. Right. Mm -hmm. If you saw when the, when the Oscars gave the Oscar to It's Hard Out Here for a Pimp, that was a minstrel mm -hmm. moment for the country because mm -hmm. all the people didn't know they would all vote for it. They were voting for it like it was a joke. Mm -hmm. But it was enough for them who have that type of consciousness deep inside of them that they all agreed on it. 
they're a minstrel. That's why when I, a lot of times when I talk about music, I always go back to the minstrel era. Like last night, I said the minstrel era was such a, a layering of, of imitation that it made our music mulatto. And we always think of the minstrel era as something just purely bad for black folks. <laughs> but it was like a lot of imitation going on. So everybody didn't want to be a minstrel in 1880. And some weren't. The Fist Jubilee singers weren't doing minstrel shows and dancing the buck and wing. But those who didn't want to do that suffered what they had to suffer. In 1970s, if you didn't want to do a kind of coon show, like Good Times or something, Dynamite and all of that, you just weren't on TV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're a rapper, you don't want to call black people niggas and do all of that what they're doing, you just don't sell records. You don't want to call women names, you don't want to put out these videos with people naked, shaking their behind and doing all what they're doing naked. It's not shocking, people have been doing that forever, but if you don't, you just don't sell your recordings and you're not pertinent. It's your choice. But it is a choice that people have been making for centuries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You Thank know? you. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my name is Tony Earls. I'm a psychiatrist and public health doctor at the medical school. I of need you. <laughs> 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for showing New up. New Orleans that. needs me. My, my question is about our hometown. He's oh, from New Orleans. Yeah, Crescent City. But, but, but the is for the panel, though. It's not just for Wenton. Okay. I mean, Wenton, yeah. I grew up on Valence and Chestnut Street. Uh, That's a good pigeon town, town and neighborhood. You, you'll know the neighborhood, you know, <laughs> and the partic particular perspective that comes from growing up in that neighborhood. Uh, but, but, but my question is about, from your perspective as a panel, what's happening in this global enriched city of New Orleans that I can't explain as a psychiatrist or public health doctor? I mean, I had a grandmother who looked at me a lot, you know, and checked me out, and I knew what those checks meant. Uh, but when I go back to New Orleans, I feel a love lost, an erosion. I don't know if it's being rehabilitated, not just from Katrina, but from years of devastating loss in public education. And I just wonder from where you, and it, you know, it's, it's touted to be one of the most violent cities in the United States, yet it's got this history, and I can't reconcile, with, I can't reconcile the two. I mean, how could this history have evaporated on us so much that we're left with a city like that that represents, you know, the Bach of the New World, I might say. Sure. But from where you sit, can you help me out as a, as a psychiatrist? I need help. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you start with this one. Yes, sir. I mean, if you, we were always violent and ignorant. New Orleans. You know, the dueling oak trees in City Park, they had to shut it down because people wanted to go there and shoot each other. That was in the 1800s. <laughs> the Robert Charles riots in 1900. The whole neighborhood thing. When I was growing up, we were very violent. We are ignorant. I mean, we can't help it. It's a part of our nature. It's what it is in terms of that part of us. But we have another part, too. It's like the opposites. Another part that's very refined and beautiful. But that, that thing, you can't take that out of us. We're kind of wild and unruly. We were always. All my studies say New Orleans was always, you know, Brown Derby, the bucket of blood. It's, it's, it's part of our character. <laughs> I don't know what to say yeah. about it. <laughs> I don't know what they were doing when you was growing up, but. <laughs> well, no, I fought. I fought. I got beat up. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Pigeon yeah, time. So when you said the eye soccer three months, yeah. I, I resonated. Yeah, with right. <laughs> Uh, but do you think the beauty is still there? Do you oh, think always. that the enrichment is still there? That, that's yeah. what I'm having a hard time getting a handle yeah, it's on. Still there. It's still there. It's still there. Yeah, it's still there, man. You can't lose that. It's still what there. about other panel members? I, I was, Went and I were talking before we came out, and I told him about an incident that happened. Um, I was invited along with uh, Janice Jackson, and, uh, who, who was here and uh, is now at Stanford. And we went as guests of uh, Warren Simmons. Uh, at the Annenberg, and we went down to try to facilitate a conversation among uh, parents and teachers and Superintendent Vallis um, about the uh, recovery district in New Orleans and also um, the charters. And I felt really like I was a, a, an interloper, quite frankly, because there was so much context there that I did not know. But what I witnessed was an uprising in an auditorium where the parents 
and Superintendent Val got into this huge shouting match. I mean, we're talking about 30, 40 parents and students about music and about how they felt that music was being stripped from the curriculum. And their question was, how could you strip music from the curriculum in a city like New Orleans when it is part of our DNA right. and part of our blood? In a so-called recovery school district. Right. right. And so right. It, was, it was tough because, you know, Superintendent Vallis, you know, and I was thinking a lot about what Secretary Duncan said last night. I mean, he was, you know, he was, I, I know he was well-intentioned, but he was saying, you know, but you, what you don't understand is your students are not making it. Your students are failing. And I know I have to make these tough decisions. But it's how do you reconcile that? I mean, it was such a heated conversation. But see, and that, I mentioned the it to him this it. morning. But the beauty of it was in the heatedness of it. Mm -hmm. I wish I could have been in there to see that, because normally people get to their thing. Mm -hmm. they, don't, <laughs> they did. And that's the beauty of it right there. And you can believe the, those parents, they were speaking it to him in the, in the king's English. Right? Okay, when they were, wasn't they speaking good English when mm -hmm. they talked? They know how to express themselves. I think I got the message. I'm going to leave early and go and beat up some people. No, no. <laughs> oh, man, you're a psychiatrist. You can't do that. You need to help the people who get beat up. But I mean, that's part of people coming back is all of the fighting and they talking. When I was growing up, nobody was going to fight over music in New Orleans public schools. My daddy had, my father taught in a public school, a music school. He called me in 1980 or 81. He said, well, man, I'm down to one student now, one in the entire school. Anybody could free. All you got to do is take audition and come in. One. So the start that New Orleans was always, everybody loved music and they, you know, New Orleans is, we have a statue of Robert E. Lee in the middle of our city, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, and, the, and we were the first city to fall in the Civil War. <laughs> he didn't do nothing to help us. I do think those, you know, suffering and creativity often come together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and out of this suffering will come more creativity. I mean, it's just, it is, I think, I mean, I'd, I am tuning in to what Karen said. She felt like an interloper. I don't know enough about New Orleans to begin to, as you do, and as Winton does, to begin to even respond to the question. But I do feel as if there are these often in places, these warring experiences of violence, uh, and it's not my word, it's Winton's ignorance, and, uh, you know, and beauty and survival and healing and creativity. And, it, and I guess one of the things that, that anyone would ask about, what is the tipping point when cities can't come back after being so deeply devastated and not cared about and left? Uh, and, and so I think there is, there is this problem of, of balancing those things and coming out of it. But I think that out of, out of suffering sometimes does come. But well, we're, we're going to come back. I just want to yeah. say about New Orleans, mm -hmm. we're going to we're going to come back. We're going to be different from how we were. The question for us That's more is a national question. But we are New Orleans. We have culture. You know, we're not. Yeah. We, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I also think that Winton talked about something earlier um, that I think is very important. And that is when when you spoke to what happens in a group normally in a jazz combo, where you know everybody's turning up their amps. <laughs> and there becomes a point where nobody can hear anything because the volume is too loud and then it's just like, it's a free-for-all. Um, and I think that in those moments of heat, if we turn down the amps just a little bit, even though there's heat, we can still listen. Uh, because in a, in a great improvisational set, there's a lot of heat. Right. Um, and so right. if we're just listening to each other mm -hmm. and, and can get over that part where we're just trying to talk over and shout over each other, then maybe we could come to some conclusion or collaborate in some way where maybe we're not agreeing on everything, but we can come up with a good solution. Mm -hmm. My mama used to always say people need, New Orleans needs a lot of therapy. Maybe you could. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to go. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Thanks. Um, where did we leave off? Um, good morning. My name is Vanessa Rodriguez. I'm a second year doctoral student here, and I came here directly from teaching for over a decade in New York City Public Schools. And we were actually having a conversation in our trio um, that we were struck about your definition of what it means to sell out. And you said um, it means having to play beneath your talent and to construct for the masses. Um, and I see that happening to teachers. Mm -hmm. And I think teachers um, are being asked to teach beneath themselves and to sell out um, and to teach for the masses. 
And so um, our question for you is about your advice for how teachers cannot sell out. You know, I think it's like not, selling out is a basic thing, basic theme. You, know, you can go to any religious mythology. There's gonna be things of belief. I think it's a, belief is always an interesting question. I always go back to, uh, and I'm not a really religious person, but I, I like the Bible. Um, it's not, not so much the, the practice of religion, but the stories are always, always so, so full of information. I like the, the one story where the, uh, I don't know if it's a, it was a, a, a man who, who led many men came to Jesus, his son was sick, and he said, I lead all, lead all kinds of people. I just tell them to do something and they do it. But my son is sick, and I know if you just say the word, when I get home, he'll be okay. And Jesus said, well, because of your belief, he's gonna be okay. Be big, I'm paraphrasing him. I hate to say that. We don't. But it's just the thought of that as a story. And that you come in, you're a young person, you got a lot of energy, now all of a sudden you, you hit with the reality. You've been out there, you're teaching, you know how the kids are, you know what it is. And you have your superiors you have to deal with, you have the politics of education. It's, oof. That's like you think you were fighting over Fort Knox or something. That's part of the challenge in front of you. If you, if you, if you tend to with challenges, look at them as if that is your challenge then you don't spend a lot of your time thinking about what if it wasn't my challenge. A friend of mine, Marcus Roberts, this blind. I'd never been around a blind person. I was like 23 or 24, he joined my band and I used to have to take him everywhere. He taught me more about a, a handicap, seeing, yes, yes. ma'am, that's right. He taught me more about seeing and he would always say, I am blind. He said, just that alone, when I could accept that I was blind when I could accept that, then I could go about seeing. Mm -hmm. As long as I was always mad that I was blind, I couldn't see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And with us in difficult circumstances, we tend to spend our time trying to change that circumstance and get embroiled in that circumstance. We have to also incorporate, it's not the changing of that circumstance, it's delivering what you came here to deliver. And, and don't practice a mistake. I had a teacher who would always, I would play ta pa ta ta pa 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 He said, you see how many times you practice that mistake? Practice it right that many times. So I don't know if that makes sense. Very, very, I'm thinking about teacher voice, you know, we talk about teacher voice and it's usually talked about in a couple of ways. One is about the special insight and vocabulary and discernment that teachers have about their own experience that no one from the outside has. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. have this intimate, deep, special understanding of the work that they're doing, the kids that they're relating to. Um, and it gives them a, a particular and singular voice to talk about that. And then voice in the political arena. Mm -hmm. Teachers taking the responsibility for joining the broader public discourse in defense of the work that they're doing mm -hmm. and propelling the work that they're doing mm -hmm. um, and in protection of the kids they're working with. Mm -hmm. And I think that teachers need to develop both of those kinds of voices. Um, and, they, and that's not an alone kind of work, that mm -hmm. those voices in communion and in community uh, two, two voices are so much more than one plus one voice. And hmm. three voices are so much more than one plus one plus one. And hmm. so to find colleagues where you are determined, all of you, not to sell out, right? Uh, and determined to figure out your particular voice um, and your singular voice, both in the political arena and in the arena of knowing that no one else can know, just you and your people in that classroom. So I think that's, um, that's, a, that's a, I think, interesting to think about when you're thinking about whatever it means to sell out and compromise and leave and walk when you, know, you need to be doing the work. Hmm. Can, can I just ask you, I mean, we, we probably don't want to go too far into this, but when you say selling out, are you, is it around high stakes testing, having to teach to test, or what, what is the?
One of the things that I, I, I really support what all my panelists have said, is, and just to add how important it is to, to have teachers voice not only talk about what's problematic, but talk about what you know and experience to be fruitful about education. So that you're not just saying what's the problem, but you're also offering some suggestions for different ways. And teachers know that. Teachers in the classrooms know what that is. And um, at minimally, it's often about, it's about methods and ways to think rather than content and factual dimensions of thinking. So, I mean, that alone, if we start thinking about that and that ties into the, to the collaboration, the improvisation, the necessity for voices to come and think together about ideas and giving students methods to think about that, tools to do that kind of hard thinking. Um, but you, you know, we need our teachers to do that and we need to help organize them to do that because I think that collectively, as Sarah said, that's just the key, to, to get together and speak a voice that you know to be so true and that's so authentic and we need that voice out there. Yeah, I, I would just say um, that you know, this panel has expressed a lot of concerns about measurement and I have concerns about measurement too. But good measurements can be very powerful mm -hmm. and you know, so I, and I, and you know, I think it can be a, a wonderful creative experience for teachers to organize around teaching to measurements that really make sense and are very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and I also just agree with Sarah that there are times where, in all their free time, where teachers really need to be activists. And, yeah. 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 Vanity. Hi, my name is Vanity G, and I'm a an, uh, master's student in the arts and education program. And uh, in my group, we were. Um, reflecting on uh, the panel's discussion of how to get people uh, to become concerned about those outside of their uh, circle of concern. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. Marcellus, you talked about um, the natural human connection and desire to know others and to connect with other people. But I wanna push back on that a little bit um, in terms of discussing what actions or steps you can take to make people want to connect to others. Also, and hmm. once you start that connection, how do you encourage people to take down those blinders that they might have towards others? Um, that's something that Professor Mapp always encouraged us to do is, as we talked about it, like what are steps we can take to make those things happen? Well, I think it's all, uh, cultural things, a meal is always good. Say it again. A, a meal. meal is always good. <laughs> something about a meal and a drink a drink is better a drink than a, a, a drink is better than a meal. <laughs> I mean, a, dr a drink always kind of you don't want to be just yourself. I mean, but a drink is, is always good. A meal is good. Uh, any type of art's always good. Repeat stories are good. Just basic, I think. I don't. I would like to hear what. I, one of the things I think about is is again bringing people together around a problem that they are invested in and realize they don't have the answers and they need others for answers. So it's, it's, it's recognizing the multiplicity of need, if you will, so that there's a, there, there's a true purpose for pushing past boundaries that divide us to say we need each other. And I think ultimately we do, but we often don't have the framework that helps us recognize that. I think in education we can create that framework to, to have problems pres presented that says, I need other disciplines, I need other people's experiences to help me figure this out. And I've also, to bring it back to the music, I just have found too that a great way for me to connect with someone else is to start talking about music. And even if their tastes are very different than mine, um, to ask a young person, especially do this, I talk a lot to teenagers on the team. Um, there are a lot of people who think I'm crazy. Um, and I've had other passengers look at me like I'm crazy. But I'm very interested in young people. And one of the things that Winton said is that, you know, we can't be afraid of, of young people. Um, and so 
But one of the ways I find that I'm able to engage in a conversation with young people on the T is asking them what they listen to on their iPhone or iPad or whatever the heck it is, music. So, so what you listening to? What, I don't know that person. Tell me about their music. What do you like about them? And I find that, this, and I think young people love to tell an old lady like me something that I don't know, right? So I think bringing it back to the music is one way. I think we, we don't often appreciate how music ties us together. I think one of the things that I always feel is that there's no such thing as small talk. Mm -hmm. You know, some people say, I don't like small talk, you know. Uh, and, uh, and I think that small talk, whatever we mean by that, is often exp an expression of the universal dimensions of our experience. Mm -hmm. You know, so let's talk baseball, let's talk the Patriots, let's talk whoever mm -hmm. we are. That there are, there are those themes, how are your kids, who are your kids, where are they? I mean, that's another, and, and that leads to those things which people feel in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And that we all feel that's in right. our hearts. Every one of us feels this way. And you discover the universal dimensions of humankind. I think the other thing that you, you mentioned earlier is storytelling, you know, which is a big right. thing that I care deeply <laughs> about. But stories are not property. You know, stories, you tell stories and it leads to other stories and it begins to weave the web of human connection because in the telling of this particular story, people can see themselves mm -hmm. and feel identified and it, it encourages them to tell their story. And so you cross all these boundaries of race and ethnicity and gender and culture and poverty in telling these stories because you link up with what we all want, what we all need, what we all care about and what we all cherish and we find it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So we are almost out of time and what I'd like to do is, Winton, since again, um, you have been an inspiration to, to all of us, uh, not only on this panel, but I think in this room today. I want to give you the last word. I mean, we have a lot of students in here who are going to go out into the world and, and, and do this fantastic work. Uh, I'd like you to give the last word. Any advice uh, you would like to give them, especially since, you know, if they're going out there and trying to cultivate sort of this moral agency and civic engagement, what advice would you give to them as they leave this place today and go and do this good work? I just saw. Uh, well, I, I always I act really crazy most of the time. My assistant, when Jen is here, I've been working with her since I was 19, and my manager I had him since I was 19, and John was could be my son, so I mess with him all the time. <laughs> We're working together. I make up slogans. I ask him stupid questions. I tease him. First time I met him, I just danced around in front of him, second line, and looking at him. I just mess with him. So I have this slogan that I always tell him, and it's this hyper-aggressive insistence through action. And that's, <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. It's kind of silly. I, do, I say it as a joke, but I mean it. Because he, he'll be saying, man, we can't get this done, or we can't do this. And what do we do? Say hyper-aggressive insistence through action. Not through talking to anybody, not hollering and screaming, not cussing anybody out. You know, it was, it's a wonderful thing that we all have talked about. You have a project that you're going to work on, there's something, there's an action. So that's the one thing I want to leave y'all with, hyper-aggressive insistence through action. Mm -hmm. And with that, I would like to thank everyone on the panel. Thank you. has been a real treat for all of us and um, we will go forth I think uh, newly inspired and excited and I want to just say uh, thank you to the audience as well thank you Kathy to our Dean who has been absolutely fabulous in uh, creating these opportunities for us so with that um, have a great day and some of you I will see you in class tomorrow. take care <laughs>